Leonard Lopez is with us, and I've had the pleasure of working with him many times at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. He'll be moderating our session today, which is entitled, A Matter for Us, Post-Colonial Nations and Color Lines. Leonard is the host of New York and Company on WNYC, as many of you know, and we're very privileged to have him here, as well as his partners today in our first panel for the Midnight Children of Humanities Festival. Thank you very much, and over to you, Leonard. Thank you, Jamie. I read recently that poor people in Tanzania and Namibia have been applying something called koroga to their skin. It's a, a homemade mixture of lye and bleach that gives them what they call the Michael Jackson look. There's hardly a place on earth where social and political hierarchies linked to skin color don't exist, but this development does come as something of a surprise. As uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and others have pointed out, the notion of whiteness is largely a modern invention, and its genesis, according to most academics, is the transatlantic slave trade and the colonialism that emerged with it. But is that completely true? We're talking uh, today, uh, inspired by Salman Rushdie's uh, Midnight's Children, hasn't skin shade been a component of the caste system on the Indian subcontinent? And what was the effect of the British Raj on that? What roles do class, gender, and migration play in post-colonial tensions? Those are some of the things we'll be talking about today. And uh, this panel is uh, perfect for that. Manning Marable, director of both the African American Studies Program and the Center for Contemporary American History at Columbia University. And Patricia J. Williams, professor of law at Columbia University, also writes a bi-monthly column for The Nation called Diary of a Mad Law Professor. I, I hope you're not going to be too mad today. And uh, Gary Viswanathan is a class of 1933 professor in the humanities and director of the Southern Asian Institute at Columbia University. That doesn't mean she was in the class of 1933. Uh, uh, I'm pleased that you all, <laughs> either that or you've aged incredibly well. Um, <laughs> because of, we have two African American uh, panelists here, I, I guess I should begin by asking you whether we should consider American racial politics as a le as a legacy of colonialism. Uh, is this an American thing, or is, do do we see this as all part of the same colonial past, Manny? Well, in the United States, racism is a word Americans. Um, believe they know a lot about, um, but what is curious, and perhaps this is a good point of departure, is that the Americans are largely distinct and outside of a general global discussion about the meaning of race, particularly in contemporary life. The United States has a fairly backward notion of what race is that most Americans believe that race is something that is either biologically or genetically anchored or derived, that it is relatively fixed. But most people throughout the world have a very different point of view about the nature of race, that it's dynamic, that it is, that it is not a thing but a process, a process that is the product of structures of power and inequality. One way of thinking about racism and this is an oversimplification, but the way that I relate it to my undergraduate students here at Columbia is that racism is the three Ps, prejudice, power, and privilege. Prejudice, the stereotyping of individuals or groups based on their phenotype, uh, their physical features, uh, some ritual or habit or, or um, a manifestation of their activity uh, that they do, the use of power to carry out the stereotype, uh, to reinforce domination, uh, and then privilege, structures that benefit those in power over and above those who are subordinated. And if one looks throughout the world, you find that when racism is defined simply as intolerance, or when racism is defined as we do in the United States is simply a fact of biological life between one group and another, and it's taken completely outside of a discussion about power and resources, 
Then in the United States, we think about race as something that's fixed and we can't change. Uh, Pat, would you agree with Manning on that? Do you think that our situation is different from what we might find in other places where there was slavery, like the Caribbean or Brazil? I, I think that it's, it's the same and different in, the sen in, 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 in that I think that where racism and race are involved, populations are generally unconscious of its power. That is its power, the unconsciousness of the given population. So in that sense, I don't think the United States is particularly um, different. Uh, I, uh, it is, um, the, the direct analogy to colonialism, I think we have an internal sense of migration, um, an internal sense of, um, rather than an external power, um, our sense of the colonizing around race has occurred within the nation. And I think that that's one the, the difference between, for example, the British Empire going out and colonizing India, for example. Um, uh, then finally, I guess I would agree with Manning Marable, to the extent we are unconscious of it, we're much more unconscious of it than we used to be, perhaps, when it was explicitly written into law. And if you look back 100 years, um, the definition of race was one that was quite malleable. It included association. You were black if you associated. Um, and you could be litigated, found to be a black person, even if they were not supposedly genetic or uh, if, you know, if your Our direct ancestors didn't come from Africa. It had to do with how you dressed. It had to do with how you behaved, who you, um, uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was a, it had many aspects of what we call class as well as uh, a biological phenomenon, as and well as phenotype. And we'll talk about classes as, as well. Um, Professor Viswanathan, uh, are people judged by the darkness of their skin in India? Uh, if you're speaking about now, um, you know, I think that question would really vary depending on uh, exactly where you're located uh, geographically as well as uh, within the caste hierarchy and also within a religious uh, uh, hierarchy. Uh, if you're speaking, uh, you know, if you're asking this question across time um, and are people judged according to the, on, on the basis of their skin um, and you want to factor in the history of colonialism, um, surely, I think you know what you might see is the consolidation of the Indian peoples coming under one one color. Even though, of course, there may be a range of uh, actual uh, physical colors, and this is actually one of the things that I have found interesting about uh, colonial history: um, the extent to which uh, you know color itself is sort of reduced to some abstract entity, and that um, racial antipathy uh, on basis of, of color is often a kind of constructed uh, racial identity. Uh, so this is how I think one might think of the colonial impact. On but the if we go back before the colonial era, in fact, three millennia to the invasion of the Indo-Europeans, uh, weren't distinctions made? They were light-skinned. They were they're the same people that um, conquered much of Europe. Uh, and um, as I understood it, part of the, the development of the caste system had to do with darkness and the people in the South discriminated against because they are darker than, uh, than a Brahmin even today. Well, sure. I mean, this is the, the Aryan myth which has been floated around for quite some time and uh, there's been a lot of uh, disputation of that myth and particularly from, um, you know, from South India and uh, the resistant movements that are, that, that are located within uh, the group that I think in the West is known as untouchables, they have really made a significant impact on the power of the Aryan myth, you know, the but white But they're darker skinned, skinned, aren't they? Well, this, this, is, this is, I think, the real question. The, the, uh, um, I, 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 the, the writings, the political writings, the literary uh, writings of the uh, untouchable groups, um, and those writings have in fact disputed whether the, uh, the so-called uh, Aryan invaders were these uh, white-skinned people, and they've drawn um, from the evidence of documents to suggest that you know this color uh, issue is actually a fabricated issue, and it has been used as a weapon to subjugate um, Dravidian peoples. Well, uh, one of the ways that the Untouchables have tried to get out of this whole thing was to convert to Christianity, and of course, the story of American slaves uh, involves mass conversion as well perhaps different strategies, but perhaps if you can tell us a bit about the untouchables and then we can get into why Christianity was so appealing to slaves. Um, the, the untouchables uh, feel that uh, by becoming Christians, they, get, they take themselves out of the caste system. Do they really? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question because um, there, 
the, the expectation, of course, is that the movement out of um, uh, an oppressed religion, uh, like Hinduism, for untouchables and into Christianity would elevate untouchables into, um, you know, into a, sort of an, an era of freedom. But yet, what, I, what is actually quite striking about um, Christian converts amongst the untouchables is the uh, you know, degree to which hierarchy is preserved within um, the Christian communities. For instance, um, even in the structure of churches, untouchables who were converts to Christianity were often given a different place to sit in the church. Burial grounds were different. They did not have the right to be, um, to be buried in the same um, uh, burial ground as you know, people who were called the, the uh, not the native, but the uh, European Christians. So there was a caste system even in, um, uh, amongst the Christian converts, and I think it's very telling as to how um, Christianity absorbed some of the aspects of, of racialism uh, that it purported to uh, transcend. For the slaves, uh, the American slaves, uh, there were different times. There was integration initially with conversion and then uh, segregation later. Would you think that integration, the fact that people sat next to each other in the churches in the earliest days, you're, you're, you're furring your brow. That's, yeah. that's what I remember the first, it's the first wave and no, the it's, second. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, it's always I, more complicated than that. <laughs> I want to back up a little bit just for about 30 seconds. Um, people of African descent who arrived in the Americas came from innumerable uh, types of states, uh, non-state societies and very uh, rigid and very complex societies. They spoke different languages, had different ethnicities. Some were Muslims. Some were Muslims. And so consequently, as people of African descent came to what became the United States, they had to construct for themselves a new kind of culture, a new sense of collective identity. And during the 18th and the early 19th century, the church, the Christian uh, faith, helped to create a kind of scaffolding for the construction of a national identity for African Americans. So the relationship between people of African descent in the US and how they viewed Christianity, because they made Christianity their own in terms of the construction of a new discourse, a language, the whole relationship between, as Du Bois put it in The Souls of Black Folk, the essence of black faith is the preacher, the music, and the frenzy, the construction of rituals and symbols that gave people not just a sense of hope, but a sense of historic possibility. So that makes it, in many real ways, somewhat different from what we're seeing in uh, the rest of the colonized world. But there are also parallels as well, because people in uh, uh, South India, people in Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States, using this imp very imperfect and contradictory tool of faith and these institutions, fashioned liberation strategies to resist oppression. And even though they were also fraught with contradictions, as you've just described, they were also in many real ways emancipatory. Could I just respond to that? Because I think please, there is a- Please don't wait for me to ask you to speak. It's, uh, you're all people who have strong ideas. Just jump in when you feel like it. There is actually a parallel situation in, in, in India too, uh, precisely as a response to the racialism of what was construed as white Christianity, um, that in fact, um, there were, amongst Christian converts, one could see uh, an attempt to forge an indigenous uh, uh, Christianity. And in fact, the references to Jesus as an Oriental rather than Jesus as a European, and this is very much part of that, and to recover the um, so-called you know, so Oriental roots of, uh, of Christianity and to found uh, a new church, as it were, that would be truly resistant, truly liberatory, but truly also detached from um, the attached the the associations that Christianity has had with European uh, colonialism. So, and this played a very important part in um, uh, national liberation, uh, the la national uh, liberation movements. And Indian Christians, for a long time, have expressed deep. Um, uh, regret and uh, that you know that the Christian Indian Christians are construed not to be you know true Indians and they often point to precisely this aspect of um, their religious history. 
I, I, as another parallel might be to Latin America, where I think the whole question of, liber of, of liberation theology is um, is is one of using the scaffolding of Christianity to create one which is indigenous, um, and. Uh, in, in, in some ways, uh, the American black church is closer to the American southern white church um, than many other areas where the actual colonist was in Europe or, 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 or at a greater distance. Uh, uh, As we've been seeing in Africa, with some, even where certain brands of, of Catholicism would not really be recognized by the Vatican, they're just simply tolerated by the Vatican. And, and I think that that first wave of, of what mm -hmm. has happened to the Catholic church is why, you know, Christian evangelicals and fundamentalists have had such hard work to go into Latin America and reconstruct it with the Assemblies of God and so forth, and um, the, the kind of missionary work that is going on in Africa and Latin America from more conservative, you know, sort of recoup from Catholic uh, liberation theology has been a very interesting political phenomenon. Um, precisely, uh, at least in some of the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of preaching, because it departs so from uh, the more colonizing influences of traditional Christianity. Manning talked about the development of a collective identity. How much of a role does skin shade, and I'm talking about the wide range of skin shade, play in one sense of cultural and collective identity? I think it's absolutely critical in a racialized society where there's a color-coded hierarchy. Um, identity is always constructed from within and imposed from without. That is, our identity is fashioned by how we imagine ourselves and the significant others in our lives, our, our parents, our lovers, our friends, family. But it is also uh, the identity that's imposed on you by the larger world. So we have uh, a situation where we have, may have a collective identity, but we also have a, a wide range of authenticities and, non, and inauthenticities. Ab absolutely. So, for example, in New York City, well, I'll use myself as a, a good example. Um, I'm an African-American. If you ask most Americans who see me coming, walking down the street, uh, what's the first thing you identify about that person? Most Americans, and this is not to say Americans are racist, but most Americans probably would say He's black, even though the he prefigures black, and that is a gendered identity, he, they would probably, the black trumps the he, okay? The, the black trumps the she. Same person goes to South Africa in Cape Town. If I don't open my mouth so you can't tell where I'm from, and I would probably have to change my glasses, although nowadays, perhaps not. Uh, in South Africa, I would be colored. In Brazil, uh, depending upon my suit and the context, I could possibly be Braca, white. The Brazilians use the expression, money lightens the skin. <laughs> so that in South Africa, for example, under the apartheid regime, Japanese were considered colored, uh, sorry, white, and Chinese considered colored. So that this is what I mean by uh, racism or structures of hierarchy are impacted by uh, notions of prejudice, power, and privilege. The Japanese have symbolically more power economically and politically than the Chinese did to the old, to the, uh, the old regime of apartheid South Africa. Hence, the Japanese magically become white. Uh, symbolically, a person who looks like me in Brazil functions like a white person. It's an interest, well, in fact, if I can, if you give me 30 seconds, there's a story that just occurred to me that actually makes this point best. 20 years ago, I was a fellow at the Aspen Institute. And um, there are a series of seminars in the summer one of the members of the seminar with me was General Ed Browney, who was a third star, three star general, who at the time was about to become Reagan's chief arms negotiator in Switzerland with the Soviet Union. He and I uh, took a bus together to go to the seminar every day. 
And he and I got in conversation in the, in the little minibus about uh, the Soviet Union and the, con the global conflict between capitalism and communism. And I asked him, isn't there any uh, possibility for us to come to terms with the Soviet Union? And he said, you don't understand, Manning. The Russians aren't like us. They lack Western civilization. They never had the Renaissance. They never understood real human feelings. And I said, aren't you saying that their political ideology of communism makes them intolerant? He said, communism has nothing to do with it. The reason we can never trust the Russians is because, he thought a minute, he said, because they are Asiatics. Now, here's the question. If for Rowney, the, it was worse to be quote unquote Asiatic than it was to be communist. And to be communist and Asiatic meant that there could be no real negotiation. But the question is, now that the Russians are no longer communist, have they become white? At least in South Africa, they are. <laughs> well, so, but, so we're talking about otherness as well. That's right. Aren't we? mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that leads to the thought, if everyone were the same color, would we still have to find other ways to identify the other? Like, in this case, Asiatics, or people who, um, who just haven't had Western civilization. Right now we have a, a president who seems to think the new white man's burden is to bring democracy to, uh, to the Middle East, or as uh, Maureen Dowd said today, uh, to give them trickle-down democracy, which I thought was a clever formulation. But um, is, since we so often think about it in terms of color and like that old blues song, if you're light, well, it's all right. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. Um, could we say that if we didn't have that, we would have to have something else? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a lawyer, Pat. Uh, well, I, I, I wasn't going to answer as a lawyer. But <laughs> let, me, um, let me just, I mean, certainly throughout history, there's always been some form of othering. Uh, and. Uh, but it, what, what strikes me as particularly precarious with regard to color at this moment in history is that we've become a, 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 not a society, not a culture, but a world very dependent upon visual media. Uh, and at, as the war on terrorism has, has, has gathered steam, so much of that has been crystallized in, in, in new suspect profiling, which seems to have been borrowed wholesale from um, uh, police work in the United States or elsewhere, sort of, and, and the, the new science of population control um, seems grounded um, in the practices of pop, po control of populations of color. Um, given as well, uh, again, the, the, the general uh, popular media, which uh, feature the good guys as wearing not just white hats, uh, but white skins. Um, uh, I, I think that this is enormously powerful, and so I think for the time being, what we're dealing with is seeing increasing numbers of people being divided into uh, light-skinned and dark-skinned around the world, even where those ethnic and religious complications um, are in fact more nuanced as basis for, basis for en enmity. Well, in, in the Bollywood films, Gary, aren't, even now, aren't most of the, uh, the heroes and heroines light-skinned, especially the women? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's true. They are, um, but yet, yet at the same time, um, there are an increasing number of Bollywood heroines who do come from South India. And um, the, one of the things, of course, that's papered over is the fact that, you know, that, that identification between South and darkness is erased by the time they get to Bollywood. And then there's a different mix that uh, uh, takes place altogether. And of course, it's true that there is this kind of uh, angst about um, uh, skin color. But if I can just backtrack a little bit, because um, you know, listening to Manning's anecdote, I was struck by uh, this really you know, wonderful passage in Midnight's Children, since that's sort of the impetus for uh, these discussions, um, where the, the, the protagonist's father talks about becoming white, you know, that he, uh, that gradually he, you know, he's transformed into whiteness. 
And he even remarks on how, you know, secretly he's, uh, he believes that virtue resides in uh, whiteness, though nobody will ever acknowledge it. And I think an even more significant um, uh, part in that passage uh, or in that uh, section is where um, while the protagonist's father is undergoing this transformation in whiteness, the uh, major industrialists in India are also undergoing this transformation into whiteness. And, and I think the point that Manning had made about how economic power is allied to whiteness is really dramatized in um, right. Rushdie's own novel. And that, in fact, I think he tries to get at that um, uh, identification between uh, uh, you know, the, the rise in economic power of a certain class in India and their assumption of a place uh, that had been vacated by the British. But for the, both the British and many of the people who've come out of the colonial experience, didn't it come down to the best dark-skinned people can hope for is to be almost the same, but not quite, almost the same, but not white? Yeah, that's part of that filtration theory, which is now being translated by Bush into these other um, uh, places of the world. Yes, this notion that you know, the uh, uh, you know, filtering uh, Western values to another society will produce an intermediate class that uh, will be familiar with your norms, your values, your language, your ethics, and so forth, uh, and will act as um, a go-between between the uh, uh, you know, between the Western elite and the, uh, you know, the lower orders. Uh, but precisely because they're inter, uh, this is an intermediate class, they will be not white, not quite. But the British are very <laughs> proud of the fact that Michael and Dachi, Arundhati Roy, and Salman Rushdie are Booker Prize winners. It's almost a way of proving that they've gotten past that, although if you travel around England, you know that they haven't gotten past it at all. Sure. I, mean, I, I don't quite know how to respond to that, uh, that uh, sense of celebration. Um, I actually think that it may have more to do with reasserting the idea of the Commonwealth rather than mm -hmm. paying any real tribute to writers right. of um, you know, the formerly colonized world. A couple of years ago, they celebrated the, all of the, the, the boats that came from the Caribbean bringing people after the war uh, to fill the spots that were empty because so many soldiers had died. And I know somebody like Carol Phillips, who teaches at Barnard here, uh, uh, his family was one of those. So they, they, they trot the, the, these, the, the people who have succeeded uh, because of that migration out. And yet, if you speak to any of them like Cass Phillips, they lived, they lived lives of terrible discrimination until they were able to get past that. And I, I think that there's also a dimension to which color has become um, a kind of verbal weapon, so it's not just visual. I said it was visual largely, but I think it's also, a, a, it's kind of a metaphor, and, and the best illustration of that was how Clinton uh, became black, uh, as Chris Rock made the famous joke about it. Um, but again, to go back 100 years, um, in, in he, would, he might have been litigated as black because of whom, of the people with whom he hung out, uh, Vernon Jordan, that would have made him, uh, in a court of law, actually black mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. jurisdictions. Um, it was how he behaved. He behaved like less than a southern gentleman. He would have been litigated as a black person. It didn't and he matter. Did, he yes. did live less, behave less <laughs> than a, yeah. a southern gentleman. Yes. No, yeah. no, he <laughs> behaved <laughs> just like a southern gentleman. <laughs> 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 um, so it isn't just, uh, it, it also, the, the, this intermediate class of those who patrol the border who are sort of, uh, you know, can go either way, was also typified perhaps by Lonnie Guineer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, there, at the same time, there were many people rejoicing, oh, well, we have a new interracial class of people in the United States who have one black parent and one white parent, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the demographics are gonna change in this regard. Well, Lonnie Guineer could have been analyzed as the perfect example of that. Um, um, she has a, a white mother, a Jewish mother, and a black father. Um, during the time that she was being attacked, she was the loony black lady. That's how she was reduced. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question of how you can go either way does, is this an ideological one, not just a visual one. Um, uh, it's, it's metaphoric in terms of this, this, this uh, it's, it's the connotation of what uh, being black means. In fact, the whole Democratic Party has been um, racialized, mm -hmm. uh, colored in a way. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add something. Pat said something about, um, uh, boundaries that I want to kind of build on. What, what racialization is about really 
has always been about in its essence, whether it's in South Asia under the British uh, colonialism or in the American South during Jim Crow or apartheid, is the construction of boundaries between individuals and between societies. At first, in the United States, when slavery was constructed and the genocidal wars against Native Americans occurred, the boundaries were the boundaries between the European settlements on the coast and the frontier. Or they were also the boundaries between the master's mansions and the slave shanties. Those same kinds of boundaries exist in a racialized society today so that racialized people carry our boundaries, that is the boundary of our skin, around with us wherever we go. So that there is a, a rough separation that symbolically is represented by color, but its actual content is not that. That is, it is the, the distance between having resources, having education, having power, and not having any of those things. And so, and we use color as a way of coding the absence or the realization of those structures of power. So the, the, the challenge has always been for racialized people, how do we erase the boundaries that separate us from the access to resources and power while not obliterating those boundaries that help, helped inform who we are, that is, our identity. Because identity in so many real ways is not just what people have imposed on you, but also how by fighting back against what's imposed on you, you begin to create something of who your own voice. And so there is this tremendous tension between in, in, in the United States and being black all, all you know, over, for, over the last 400 years, this is a recurring problem. That is, that the racism drives you crazy, and yet at the same time, the fight against it gives, sustains hope, dignity, it gives you a sense of direction and purpose, it gives you a sense of history and agency. And in, you know, for African Americans, we're dedicated to understand and destroy the, we have to understand the very thing that we're dedicated to destroy, which is race. And yet, as we do that, what happens to our identity? Well, since race is a construct, an unscientific construct, then right. that identity is something that is separate. And that's the subject of a, a film, an Australian film, I don't know if you've seen Rabbit Proof Fence, where a good, uh, well-intentioned, but uh, obviously mistaken uh, Australians believe that uh, mixed race aborigines, uh, if they are allowed to integrate into the white world and then intermarry with white people, eventually will become totally civilized and nobody will even notice or know that they were once aborigines. Uh, which brings me back to Salman Rushdie, the, a number of the midnight children have light hair and blue eyes. They're mixed race children. Uh, they are the bastard children of colonialism. Are they also, would they also eventually be expected to um, be to rise above, or would they always be considered um, something lesser because of the colonial connection? I think Rushdie uses the you know the idea of these mixed uh, uh, children in in very effective and very productive ways because I think he tries to tap that theme into um, you know the the issue of India's modernization and looking at this at this mixed breed not as a, as a corruption or as an aspect of India's past that has to be um, uh, rejected, but in fact to use these very children who have these, these, you know, this mixed blood as perhaps India's future as well. So there is a, to, to a large extent, I think he um, intends uh, his readers, uh, maybe you know, the degree of success may vary, uh, as to who the reader is, but certainly I think he does intend for us to look at the, these children as a, as a product of, um, uh, you know, sort of an inescapable uh, cross between you know, India and, and England, and to look at that cross as the basis for, um, for a modernization that, would, that, could, uh, that could absorb the past without quite uh, rejecting it altogether. Well, I do remember a Sajjajit Ray film where the, this woman who was half and half 
was really never really accepted, even though she spoke, I guess uh, in that case it was Bengali, as well as everyone else. She'd grown up in India, but everybody called her the Anglo or, uh, or something along those lines. So is that changing? Uh, and in time, do you think these things do change? Well, today's India, I think, is just so hard to uh, avoid the the uh, uh, you know the the sort of in-your-face quality of the change because uh, it, it is really hard now to locate the boundaries, you know, of um, you know what what is Western, what is uh, 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 you know I, I hate to use words like indigenous or native, but it, I, I I hope uh, you know the audience will understand what I'm referring to, and of course you know uh, movements uh, you know political movements that are deeply uh, alarmed by what they see as the corruption of a pure Indian selfhood. Um, you know, it's, it's those movements that are producing some of the more alarming um, uh, tendencies, you know, sort of fascist, hin Hindu-leaning uh, um, tendencies, uh, which still harken back to some kind of, um, you know, territorial purity and uh, using that notion uh, to, uh, to exclude, um, to marginalize, um, um, and in fact, I think instituting a new, um, not a color hierarchy as such, but um, uh, you know, a new, um, a new hierarchy based on um, you know, uh, location in the land, who is there first, becomes the question of priority, not what colored uh, skin uh, you have. But what, which is preferable, being a cultural nationalist and saying that you don't want to accept the, uh, the things that have been imposed on you or uh, excelling at cricket and soccer as uh, has uh, happened in some of the former British colonies to the point where didn't India just beat Britain uh, to the great joy of the, the, whole, the whole Indian nation? But, but in a way that looks like it, it's an, just acceding to the, the, the things that were imposed by the colonial power. You're shaking your head no, Manning. No, I mean, no. baseball everywhere, America will wind up being in the no, in the next I, imperialist I, phase? No, I'm, I'm channeling for C.L.R. James here. Um, in Nello, uh, C.L.R. James, uh, in Beyond a Boundary, in his classic work, shows how cricket is, this is, in fact, the analogy is quite a nice one with African-American spirituality and faith, that the West Indian people took cricket and made it their own, and how they articulate their uh, nationalism, their culture, their physicality, their sense of time and music and their gift of grace, all of that is found in cricket. And colonized people seized it and turned it around. James Nays Naismith uh, created basketball in, at, the, at the YMCA in Springfield, Missouri in 1892. Uh, I think things have changed since then. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons I loved Midnight's Children is, is this dreamy quality, and it does feel like a lot of what happens with this taking and making of one's own is that you sort of dream through um, the imagery and mythology, um, even of the oppressor, and it becomes your own. And, and, and to some extent, you can end up on the one hand like Michael Jackson, where the dreaming becomes so literal that you carve it upon your body, or um, on the other hand, uh, you know, or somewhere, in, I, I, was, as, as when I was thinking of this, I kept thinking of, of, of Six Degrees of Separation, John Guare's Six Degrees of se uh, Separation, or Puddinhead Wilson, uh, this, this, this sense of turning oneself inside out or changing places. Um, and I guess a few years ago, there was a play, a, a, a presentation of, of Puddinhead Wilson, um, in which um, all the parts got mixed up so that the light-skinned child who was adopted by the, uh, uh, or, or placed in the white family was actually played by a very dark-skinned actor um, and delivering all these same lines. And it did sound a little bit like Michael Jackson speaking. <laughs> and and, this, and this, it became quite surreal watching mm -hmm. this without any sense of visual racial boundary. Um, but you began to hear the politics of it uh, being spoken. You began to hear what, you know, somebody called the Uncle Tom voice um, writ large. Um, uh, Anna DeBeer Smith, the performance artist, does a lot of this. Um, she, she's done her Twilight Los Angeles and uh, by, yeah, by mixing up, uh, the, the, the voices are actually of, 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 for example, the white police chief of Los Angeles, um, but you'll have a 12-year-old Latino boy speaking the, 
his actual words. And it's a very fascinating kind of, uh, again, sort of magical realist. Uh, Midnight's uh, Children begins with the partition of India and Pakistan and what followed is one of the saddest and bloodiest mass migrations in world history. Of course, African Americans were also forced into a great and awful migration. And uh, I'm thinking, wondering about the impact of migration. Doesn't migration mean one has to relinquish the past in order to survive in the present? And what, is that, what has that meant for the, 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 uh, the countries that Rushdie has written about? What has that meant, do you think, for um, the adjustment of African Americans to this country? Well, I think Rushdie couldn't have written this novel if he had um, sort of relinquished the, the, the past. Um, as, a, as, a memory, as a memory and as a concept, but in fact... But he didn't, but well, he has relinquished the past in another way because he lives elsewhere, but people were forced to give up everything that they had to move to an, another place because of some artificial decision. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether I would agree with you that, um, you know, by moving someplace else, you relinquish uh, the past. You know, I think that that, that, that gives a, a very partial view of migration as um, sort of very finite and uh, very linear. And um, that you know you somehow don't you know continue aspects of yourself someplace else. Someplace else. In fact, I think that is one of the remarkable things about uh, the, the the writings of, of people who have migrated. The 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 fact that they reveal the extent to which their 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 identities, uh, their existence someplace else. That they are living such layered exi existences. So to that extent, I actually, I would disagree with you. Um, that I was just you throwing out an idea, that actually. Would, that one would actually leave um, uh, something behind. And I think in a way that, uh, you know, with R Rushdie's particular case, uh, you know, if, you, if one wants to say, well, he left India uh, and, um, or Pakistan and, and uh, migrated to England and made that his home and then subsequently the United States, um, then what is, where, does, where do India and Pakistan figure in, uh, in his consciousness? Are they merely sort of the uh, uh, you know, sort of productive sites for his own um, writing experimentation or do they have uh, no other role? I think that in some ways the writing does, became, does become a natural outcome of, of, of having to work through the reality of migration. It's certainly not the kind of migration we're talking about, in fact, you know, to even speak about uh, migration in relationship to the African American experience is, is really to do grave injustice. Right, in uh, terms to of the, the transatlantic term. slave trade. Right, exactly. So I yeah. think that the, the, the issue of language is really critical, and, um, and I actually feel that we are sort of hampered by the inadequacy of our vocabularies to talk about movements of people from one region uh, to another. Right. The, the, the transatlantic slave trade took place over about four centuries. Um, in, it involved perhaps as many as 100 million people. It, in the, in the Americas uh, the, and the Caribbean, about 15 million people were transported from about 1550 to about 1870. But it doesn't include the millions of people whose bodies were thrown overboard in the South Atlantic or the millions who died in the barracoons or the forts awaiting transportation, or the millions who were killed in Africa during the wars that were provoked by Europeans with the influx of textiles and uh, weapon, weaponry over a period of several centuries. So yeah, there, there are differences. But the parallels, though, with India um, in terms of migrations, uh, the first thing I thought of was the Great Migration of 1915-1960, uh, 1960, where about six million, six and a half million African Americans moved from the rural south to the urban north in uh, what was in the United States uh, the, one of the most profound mass migrations of Americans in the first half of the, tw of the 20th century. African Americans went from being 90% rural in 90% southern in 1900 to being now the most urban population on the North American continent. So that it, the analogies, historical analogies are rough and they're inherently dangerous to make. But there is something of the fact that the, the forced migration of populations in Pakistan and in India created a kind of mass trauma 
or a distancing in a way of one kind of history to the entering of a new kind of history, the same parallels do fit for black America because in our memory of black culture and consciousness, so much of the blues could not have been constructed originally um, in as much as people love blues in this city, New York City, had to come from the Mississippi Delta. The products of our culture and our faith and rituals coming out of the deep south in a rural area are a product of a particular historical moment. And with the trauma of, mo of movement, of the migration, a whole new way of seeing ourselves and imagining our communities comes into being. And I think that perhaps the, 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 the analogy doesn't quite fit with India and Pakistan, but in, but in a real sense, Rushdie points to the construction of new kinds of societies where people see themselves in different ways and that the migration was a kind of break, kind of a, um, a transition in a way. I think that um, I remember having a conversation with Helen Bamber, who's a doctor in Britain who works with refugee populations, and she described the fact that they frequently will hold themselves together through tremendously traumatic experiences of war and dispossession. Um, and they come to Britain um, as, as asylum seekers, um, and they confront racism in Britain, and that's where they snap. That's where their mental state is most in danger. Um, and we're having this conversation in the context of precisely the American migration of blacks from north to south. The bulk of that migration, particularly occurring just around the time of the civil rights movement, um, coming to great cities, finding, them, finding uh, police officers and other con mm -hmm. housing constraints and job constraints uh, as the economy sort of fell through in places like Chicago. That's when the riots occurred. That's when people really had difficulty um, with what they had idealized as the freedom of the north, uh, the, 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 the migration north. And, and, and it's also interesting, I think that's the point at which you see in, even in African American literature a certain, and film, a certain kind of uh, magical realism. That I'm thinking particularly of movies like Charles Burnett's To Sleep With Anger. Um, in which he uses the language of migration. You know, it's, it's, there's sweet home, down home. Um, uh, you come to the, to, the, to the new world and uh, the trickster figure follows you somehow as, as a kind of nostalgic memory and um, bedevils your every effort to assimilate, essentially. Well, what we have with Rushdie is a, a man who's living in, in other countries, writing passionately about his own, his, the, the India and Pakistan. And we saw the same thing in, uh, with the black emigre writers who went to France mostly, Richard Wright, and mm -hmm. Chester Himes, and especially James Baldwin, writing passionately about America at the same time, at the same time they felt they couldn't live here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any, uh, if we see any parallels there, but uh, perhaps sometimes people have to leave to be able to really understand what's going on. That's right. Well, it's, it's not surprising. Um, many writers here who live in the city um, have to get out of the city in order to be able to write about it. That you need some distance from the thing that you love or the thing that drives you crazy. And for Jimmy, I know that Jimmy's deep, Jimmy Baldwin's deep love for this country, not so much what it was, but what it could be, Richard's right, Richard Wright's passion for the United States and the possibility of what uh, a truly multiracial democracy might look like could not be realized in his own time. And so he could only express that love through anger and protest at a, at a great distance. But the distance gave him the space to articulate this alternative vision. And looking at South Asian writers, um, you know, the lar large numbers of uh, them who have, in fact, uh, moved to the West, be it England or the United States or Canada, um, what, what is quite striking, of course, is that in their writings, um, they're not necessarily focused on the place that they live uh, immediately, but do write so uh, obsessively, one might say, with, uh, you know, the countries that they've left behind, uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, etc. And uh, and, and if one looks at um, the, the engagement with um, you know, happenings in 
in the, the countries that they've left behind, you know, uh, issues of uh, the environment, for instance, or religious fundamentalism or political corruption. I'm very struck by how, uh, in, in these writers, um, uh, you know, th certainly th there must be an element of, of guilt. Um, I think everybody sh has that sense of, of no longer being involved, um, uh, you know, with the movements uh, going on in one's own country. Mm -hmm. But the engagement from elsewhere, of course, it, it allows for a certain distance and a capacity to write more dispassionately about these developments. But I also think it, it gives the space for uh, talking about the future of their countries in, in more utopian ways mm -hmm. that might be a little more difficult if, it, if one were actively involved uh, with one's own environment. I mean, I certainly feel that. Every time I go to India, and I do spend a lot of time there, I feel enormously depressed in a way that I don't when I'm out here because I feel that there's some capacity for moving towards another stage of, of, of activity. Whereas when I, when I am in India, I feel so engulfed by sort of the despair of things, that I, I, I do often wonder whether uh, writing from the outside gives scope for um, a certain con utopian vision that uh, might be uh, not necessarily available if one, was, one were writing from within the situation. And both utopian and fundamentalist. It's, I mean, I, I, when, when you were speaking, I was thinking of Zadie Smith's um, yes. White Teeth, um, that, that the distance Absolutely. is both the, 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 the the, the fertile ground for, for a kind of utopianism, but also a kind of nostalgia that hardens into uh, a, a kind of um, mm -hmm. fundamentalism as well. A, another factor might be the circumstances of, of why you left, whether you left because you mm -hmm. were unhappy with where you were or whether you were forced to. Jose Donoso, uh, probably the, uh, as much as anybody responsible for magical realism, uh, died recently. Uh, he told me that when he was forced to leave Chile because of the, the Pinochet government. He was in Madrid. Santi uh, Santiago became the most wonderful city in the world, and he wrote about it as, a, as a, a lost paradise. And then after Pinochet fell and he went back, uh, he said he found it was this depressing jerk water, a place that was nothing like what he had made it into. So there's a, if, you're le if you're forced to leave, you may very well remember things quite differently than uh, as in your case, you keep on going back and almost reinforcing some of the worst depressions, uh, the, the, some of the reasons that you might that might have uh, made it easier for, the, for you to leave in the first place. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, though at the same time, I, I do think it's very hard for a lot of people who've, who've, who've left to um, sort of find an adequate role in, um, you know, for themselves uh, in, the, in, in their countries without quite seeming as, um, as uh, with how, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, that, you know, I think one is always afraid of sort of coming in at it from, um, from a perspective that doesn't quite share the immediate, uh, you know, travails uh, of the situation. I've often heard that, you know, if one had to deal with this 365 days of the year, you know, it, it, would, be, you know, you, it would be a different kind of response than if one, you know, experiences this for, say, you know, 60 days a year or 95 days of the year or... Does it matter how one looks at it? I, I, Salman Rushdie once wrote, the novel, is, the novel is the stage upon which the great debates of society can be conducted. He says not only uh, are they meant to entertain or to amuse, but to provoke and to question, as he puts it, everything in every possible way. Now, he's, he sees it as the role of the novel. Uh, is it, can the novel do things that someone who's doing serious sociological analysis or political analysis can't do? I know, I think from, um, you know, one has to, uh, I think one has to acknowledge uh, sort of the, uh, the writer's uh, investment in his or her own uh, mission um, and seeing that as having, you know, direct sociopolitical impact. Though, but first, you know, I think by and large, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not all that easy to accept that you know, writing a great novel of, uh, that would lead towards some uh, social transformation would necessarily produce uh, that transformation. I'm not saying anything that's particularly inspiring here, but um, there, it does reveal, I think, a big gap between the, uh, the headiness of uh, the artistic mission and 
the, the day-to-day -day realities that do involve um, you know, active, um, but also very it's like mundane activities on the ground, which don't really get into you know, sort of the, the more elevated reaches of uh, academia or uh, you know, art. You don't write novels, Manning. Well, I think that, um, you know, I'm not, literature is not my thing. I'm a mundane social scientist. But what I've learned from the people I admire in literature is that great literature changes the way we see ourselves. And that's the key in terms of literature and its power. Uh, it's because it's the power of imagination. And it can place us, it can catapult us in the sense of, um, I think of Richard Wright's Black Boy. Uh, Wright creates a world of 1925 Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi that no longer exists. But through the book, we enter that world. Through Rushdie's Midnight's Children, we enter that world. We understand the world from that point of view, and it helps us to see ourselves in a different way. And I'm currently working on this biography of Malcolm X, and I think the parallel for me is that Malcolm's great strength was that he changed the way black people saw themselves. And in that sense, his function was very much like that of a novel. And I, I wouldn't remove the role of literature so far from the social scientists. I mean, as a lawyer, I think that the, the same kinds of interpretive dilemmas that uh, theorists in, in literature, for example, are facing, or what we are facing in, in terms of the interpretation of the Constitution. One of the reasons I so disagree with Scalia and Thomas mm -hmm. um, are that they are strict textualists. They have a mm -hmm. kind of nostalgia for the founding fathers and the way they thought. There's very little play between the word and its meaning. You know, and it, if it meant this, it meant that in 17 whatever, or 18 so and so, and that's all it can mean. And people who interpret that closely with no sense of play, um, um, not only have no literary sense, um, they're, you know, I, I feel it risks a kind of punitiveness, a kind of, it's a constructed nostalgia. That's what I meant by fundamentalism mm -hmm. earlier. It's a, it's a kind of nostalgia um, for a world that, that, that once existed, but the, the, the fundamentalist really hasn't experienced, um, but knows it must be better because, again, in the context of, for example, Zadie Smith's, you've, you've, you've encountered racism rather than an ideal world in the New Britain, as opposed that, 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 the, that, the, that the hope of a movement in the civil rights movement when you came north um, has been uh, dashed, and therefore you idealize and imagine and make it, or even, you know, we, we still, you know, imagine the city on the hill, and, and, and that's why people become fundamentalists mm -hmm. around the Constitution or whatever body, textual body. That's a, that's a study of words, the study of relationships mm -hmm. that, that I think is, 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 is central to the psychology of literary interpretation. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to open this up to questions from you. But uh, Gary, you told me uh, that the music of southern India has become popular throughout the country, even though uh, southern Indians have been relatively discriminated against. Um, is, that, is there any similarity uh, to the popularity of uh, hip hop music in this country? with young Americans, do you think that it's a way to, to bridge the color divide or is it likely that, that the people who are enjoying that music still gain no insight into the lives of the people who make that music? Uh, first of all, just a, um, a, a correction. Uh, when you were saying South Indians are discriminated against, I, I'm not qu quite sure what kind of discrimination you're referring to, but it's really more of sort of cultural attitudes yeah. that are... Well, they would look uh, down yeah, on... Yeah, but not necessarily... Yeah, I don't, you know, we shouldn't be confused. We're talking about discrimination in the legal or uh, you know, civil sense. Um, sure, there has always been this um, sort of invisible barrier between uh, North India and South India that has to do with differences of language, differences of... Uh, of culture um, and, uh, and music, you know, different systems of music. So sounds that used to be very unfamiliar, strange, alien, um, and therefore sort of lower order, that, that, that situation sort of changed with the, um, 
with this kind of music now coming... Um, we're talking about Carnatic uh, music? No, I'm not talking about... We're talking about sort of popular uh -huh. um, uh, South out Indian music. Out of the movies. Music. Yeah, right, exactly, out of the movies. But, you know, uh, music that draws on folk, uh, folk music of the South. So <laughs> what used to be very strange and um, um, unfamiliar suddenly became through the um, instrument of uh, Bollywood a little more um, um, accessible. You know, the question that you had asked about the gap between um, um, sort of uh, affinity to the music and uh, actual affinity to the people, uh, I, you know, I'm sure Patricia and, um, and Manning will have something to say to that. Uh, but in, uh, I, I'm, I don't know if I can answer that directly because I'm not, I don't really know whether cultural attitudes have remarkably um, transformed. Uh, I have no basis for uh, for answering that question, but I do think, just in a very intuitive way, um, I have no um, sort of documentation to you know support my view. But I do think that um, the kinds of uh, you know uh, statements I would hear earlier on about how this this music sort of jars on the ear, I haven't heard in quite the same way. And and I, as I say, I'm just saying very intuitively that this may have something to do with. Um, you know, so the, the role of Bollywood in uh, mainstream Indian culture. Mm. Well, hip hop right now, I think the, the what is it, eighty percent of the audience that's right. is white. That's right. Uh, the people who and purchase Eminem hip hop is the only really big white artist. So all the rest is uh, white kids buying music records made by black artists. This is true. Although this is not a new thing. That it, one can go back a couple centuries and see how the creative and the musical imagination of white America has been structured, the foundation of that has drawn directly from or stolen from African American culture and music. But the difference is that in the past jazz, uh, a black art form, uh, when it became a mass, uh, you know, a mass mm -hmm. movement, a mass art, uh, it was performed by white artists. Uh, when rhythm and blues songs came along, uh, and doo-wop, uh, it was Boone, the cover records, the it cover. was the Pat Boone records that, not the, the original records that, yeah, but that had the, the big sales, but today <laughs> it's the black artists, uh, maybe that changed with Motown, but uh, it's the black artists. I would say hip-hop is still relatively new, and we have Eminem yeah. as the first wave of a whole new generation, I am absolutely sure. And, and, hip-hop is had 20 years old. Yeah, no, but, but in terms of its mass appeal, in terms of its mass appeal, and, and you know, it's, it's, I was having a conversation with a group of other sort of middle-class black parents, all of us having their children in, in mostly white schools, and and all the little white kids come in and they've got baggy pants and they've got on backwards baseball caps, and their ideal is hip-hop through the embodiment of Eminem. And my son, you know, I'm sitting here trying to not just teach, you know, not it's the equivalent of cricket, I suppose. You know, I'm, I'm, but I'm, it, it's it's a very interesting play of stereotypes and play of identities because you know I don't want my son to be picked up by the police. You know, he's, a, he, and so I want him to dress in a little polo shirt. You know, that says Izod on the side. You know? and, um, for his own protection, it's not right. just about the mind. It's about how he's going to be greeted in the world. But he wants to imitate his white classmates who are imitating black, black people. <laughs> and you know, he's actually got, you know, he, he comes home and he imitates and he's got the little lean and he's doing this thing and he's do or whatever this is. You know, and you know, I am just appalled. I just don't know what to do. But it is this bizarre sort of cultural it's, it's not quite a bridity, it's a sort of mm. sloshing back and forth of imagery that is um, uh, in which his little white classmates look at him, who really, and we, you know, we have no hip hop in the home at all, but they look at him and when he speaks some of the lines, the few lines he's picked up from mm. them, they think he is so authentic. They are just love it. Um, and since they've known him from kindergarten, they also love the fact that they're a little afraid of him, you know, because he's bigger than they are. And, and so I think this is actually reinforcing of certain stereotypes. This music f forms a cultural function that's far beyond the actual politics of the original um, kids in the ghetto who are expressing a, a real political sentiment. Um, how it gets played out in the suburbs or in white mm. schools is, is fascinating to me. Um. <laughs> well, my take on hip hop, I'm, I'm, more sympath I'm very sympathetic to hip hop. Um, in, about a year ago, we had a, uh, Russell Simmons and I had a public dialogue here um, talking about the uh, contradictions of hip hop culture and music, but also the strengths of it. That, well, just really two things. Just on hip hop itself, 
Um, there's all of the misogynistic and backward and homophobic elements of hip hop uh, in, embodied in gangster rap, but there are also very progressive currents in this uh, musical art form from, from the very beginning, from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five to uh, Naz and Most Def and KRS-One that some of the younger people in the audience could immediately identify with. But the point I was trying to make with hip hop is that African Americans, like many oppressed people throughout the world, through the cultural statements that they produce, their art, they see their art as a way of finding voice in a society that denies it constantly. They seize art as a tool that allows them to express their aspirations. And that here in this country, over, you know, repeatedly, white Americans have, you know, seized that tool and turned it into their own, in a way. And part of that is a function of power, and part of that is a function of the market. That uh, black artists, you, you know, you, even within the hip hop tradition, have um, been the producers of the culture, but aren't the owners of it. And that's really the continuity. Questions from the audience, and please, um, not, no long speeches, simple questions. One thing I, I found very um, shocking in Cape Town is how divided it is on the outskirts between uh, different races of people from the days when they were forcefully relocated. And I just wanted to ask you um, to what extent you think this inhibits moving forward now towards better racial unity and how it perpetuates uh, thoughts of value based on race even today and what can be done about it. It is deeply offensive, um, and it is so horrific that it is actually awesome, in the truest sense of the term, awesome. Um, you go to Cape Town, and you go outside the city, north of the city, and there's this vast ghetto called Kailicha. And um, there's another ghetto that is much tidier and somewhat more middle class, and I use that term very loosely, uh, crossroads. And these vast ghettos where hundreds of thousands of people live without running water, with pit latrines, uh, close proximity, cardboard and steel t and, and, and tin roofs and tin sides of the buildings, it is so, it, 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 it's hard even for us in this country to wrap our minds around the kind of human tragedy that exists, that existed under apartheid, and that the ANC against tr tremendous odds is trying to transform. Um, the question really points to, and the link between the question and Midnight's Children is the legacy of colonialism or the legacy of apartheid that the state always has a vested interest in reproducing and managing difference. So that in, under the British regime, there was a clear interest in the 19th century to reproduce the British version of what they meant by caste. But in doing so, they actually constructed something that drew elements from the historical model, but was not that. That is, their notion of it was, in, was, was largely fueled by the, the interest and utilities that they had as a colonial regime to ensure the exploitation of the masses of Indian people. In South Africa, a parallel situation occurred where you get legal constructs of identities, colored, Bantu, creating a fictive category, putting people of a variety of different ethnicities, languages, traditions, rituals into one size fits all, and then allocating uh, certain liabilities or benefits, few benefits, according to the category. And so the state was responsible for producing both these kinds of social categories as well as the physical kind of sites where people live 
You destroy the state, and yet you can't quickly or immediately transform the, 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 the situation on the ground, but also the situation of division in people's heads. Because when the state allocates resources, constructs a kind of public identity, allocates resources around that, and then you get rid of the state, those divisions in your head and between people don't disappear. And it takes a long time for that to be transformed. Anybody want to add, or should I go to another question? Uh, another question? Well, obviously you're very pleased with what you heard. Oh, there was one over there. Hi. Um, have, have you guys had an opportunity to read the book? Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask you a question from um, a chapter, the chapter on, I think it's methyl and, and the of Midnight's Children when they transfer power and the, um, the ancestor of the original, um, he goes through this whole sort of, uh, I, I'm not sure, it's, he, he sets up everything for the transfer of power at the same time that India and Pakistan split. And I wanted to pose it to anyone and what do you think he was actually trying to, um, what was the symbolism there? Um, that, that's it. You mean the symbolism about transfer of power? Right, the character, um, Methel. And um, he, he kept, everyone had to, uh, to they, he rented out these homes, or he sold them with everything in them. Um, and they had to keep things as they were until um, the exact time at which there was a transfer of power. I think you've sort of even answered your uh, your question here because it's the the uh, you know the, the continuity between the colonial order and the post-colonial order through the sort of the, the stability of uh, you know homes and and material objects. And uh, so forth, and of course, you know, Rushdie uses uh, allegory so freely uh, in this in the novel to you know to make these correspondences between the individual um, uh, and history. Um, so I'm I'm not sure if I'm adding any more to what you've actually already said in your uh, in your in your comment, other than to. Uh, to, to take it one step further, um, to in fact even look at um, sort of the, the, the racial diffusion of the, the white colonizer in uh, the Indian, um, you know, amongst the Indians, sort of the, you know, the question that Leonard had asked earlier on about, uh, you know, mixed breed, you know, the idea of the, the Midnight's children as being this composite, um, as it were, of, of uh, many different races, um, you know, different uh, colors, different, uh, different origins. Um, and to what extent is this actually the, uh, uh, the offering of a new, uh, you know, secular, uh, pluralistic uh, India? It's a way of transforming what might be considered as a debilitating legacy, um, where one, could never, one, one can never really trace one's origin properly, that every origin sort of comes up against a stumbling block. You find that you are not as pure as you, as you thought you were. Uh, but how to transform that, that, that startling sense of one's own mixed uh, origins into, the, uh, into, you know, into a new set of possibilities signifying a secular pluralistic fabric? I see your hands. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I think it might help people who haven't read the book recently that Methwald was Salim's father. And so it right. makes your point. Mm -hmm. um, and also his, his uh, antecedents were the founders of the first colony. Uh, and Salim is the protagonist, Midnight's Child, who uh, represents the New India. Uh, uh, my question is, is uh, it, it's, uh, it's not precise. Uh, many people I encounter who are my friends and my students who are of African American descent uh, really have almost a knee-jerk response that Salman Rushdie represents a kind of racism in his work. And um, I think it's really important that that question be addressed, particularly at the beginning of a, a humanities festival that uh, is devoted to understanding more about South Asia and the implications uh, 
for our greater understanding of uh, other environments that are equally complex. I, uh, anyone want to uh, respond to that? Some of my students are here. I think they would probably like to hear your response. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, satanic verses has, off, has really bothered me, um, you know, in precisely the way that it's, uh, um, you know, that there, the, the critique of racism doesn't quite exclude um, um, sort of the racial characterization of other South Asians, especially, um, you know, those who, uh, you know, are rel relatively impoverished. You know, the, the, for instance, the depiction of the Bangladeshi uh, uh, restaurant owners. Um, you know, the, uh, the participation in the racialization of, um, you know, of this group, you know, uh, um, as opposed to other uh, more privileged uh, migrants uh, coming to England. Uh, I'm not sure if this is exactly the kind of discussions that you've had um, uh, with your students, but it's certainly um, a real issue in, um, in, in the works. And you know, I think Satanic Verses has often presented itself to my mind as one of the most uh, difficult novels precisely because of its uh, um, um, sort of even, you know, one might say um, sort of a, a obtrusive racism despite the critique of racism at other levels. But since Rushdie has also been a critic of racism in many ways, in fact, I, can, I even have a couple of quotes here that I'm not going to go into, but where he gets into the whole matter of stereotyping, he is a novelist and he is a provocateur, isn't he? And can we separate what we read in a novel from uh, the, the opinions of the person who wrote the novel? I mean, is he a, a racist because he has people talking in racist ways? Huh? I, I, mean, I don't think it's just he has people talking in racist ways. I mean, I, again, I, I, I think <coughs> that during some of the controversy around Satanic Verses, he spoke not as a novelist, um, but in ways that were deeply troubling. Um, despite the clear equities of what was going on, I, I, I was very troubled by what, what Salman Rushdie said at various moments. Um, and uh, I, 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 I remember thinking that he's, he was, in many ways, in my mind, very similar to, to Donald Woods, I believe, who wrote the novel Cry Freedom, mm -hmm. um, right. who, you know, who wrote a book about the liberation was on the right side of the apartheid issue, um, but in person would you know, tell native jokes and imitate patois and, and, and was a very um, uh, condescending uh, British colonial product. Um, and I, I think that that's perhaps in the nature of, of, of human beings who write fiction and whether we accept the fiction as separate from the, from, mm -hmm. from the beings or not. But I, I, in sad, terms sad. of where this comes from, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward where it comes from. It's not just in the novel. I think that, that Rushdie himself is, is a, can be a quite problematic figure in terms of what he says directly. Yeah, I was just going to say that you know, Manny had earlier talked about the role of literature in transforming uh, people and, and um, uh, promoting um, changed attitudes in more positive ways. But if that is the case, then I do think you know, some of Rushdie's representations are problematic uh, mm -hmm. because they reinforce those very attitudes that um, you know, I think it would be very difficult for a writer to take refuge by saying I'm merely sort of having these people who are distant from me. So I think that question of um, um, how, uh, you know, how racism is, is dealt with at all levels, um, it, 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 it's, it's a question that I think is deeply problematic in some of the novels. The, um, my take on this is a little different, uh, maybe about 10% different. Um, I'm also troubled by, especially in the satanic verses, and um, some of the imagery and some of the language, and particularly, as Pat is saying, um, the kinds of political commentaries that were made as the controversy occurred. At the same time, uh, I agree with uh, Rosa Luxemburg that freedom is always and only freedom, she said, for the one who thinks differently. So that I believe in my, my politics embraces the idea that people should be able to construct art as they imagine it even as contradictory and flawed as it may be, because that's where doors of imagination open up. So for me, um, art is a site of contestation, of challenge, and that uh, you're going to find people who produce frequently great art are deeply as flawed and contradictory 
as the societies which produce them. I, and I'm not sure I would, if, if, if I'm understanding you right, I would grant some sort of special space to art for art to do that, because this is very similar to the, the, the Thomas Jefferson question. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just in art. Uh, it, it is a question of, can you have somebody who writes of, you know. The Alice uh, Walker question. It, you know, like people, Alice yeah, well, attacked, uh, yeah, yeah but the color purple. But, 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 but Thomas Jefferson was clearly writing in the realm of nonfiction. Right. It's not okay. necessarily artistic, um, and it's contradictory. And it has actual impact. Notes on Virginia. Mm -hmm. you know, and then Dostoevsky was, yes. was a yeah, bigot, it, it's, and so was Cezanne, and so yeah, was Degas. And in the end, do we, uh, Celine, what do we do with those people? Or how do we fashion our ideas from what they have to say that's, that is useful? Well, I think some, many of you might be familiar with uh, the controversy that was unleashed um, f four or five years ago. Um, uh, the New Yorker had a special issue on uh, uh, India's 50th um, uh, independence. And uh, uh, Rushdie had a piece in it where he said that no good writing has ever come out of the Indian vernacular languages. And of course, that really yeah. just was a, was a can of worms. And, and it's been very hard for him to um, um, sort of really, uh, you know, sort of face, uh, you know, face particularly Indian um, uh, reading public uh, who were very dismayed um, that such uh, a comment could be made, and to set English up as the, uh, you know, superior language which alone has produced a superior literature in India. So this is, I think, this again goes to uh, Frank's question about. Um, you know the. I mean, but I, the the question in my mind is: Is this you know is this comment about um, the, uh, the the relative uh, you know, superiority of literature? Is this a question of racism, or is this a question of of, of a certain literary um, aesthetic? I mean, I, this is really, I think, uh, um, you know, we all deal with this, this question in our, in our classes, that can we separate, you know, the, uh, the idea of aesthetics from one's own um, uh, politics or one's own sense of race and culture and so forth. So uh, I think that in, in Rushdie's case, the um, sort of the claim for a certain privilege status that literature has um, is even more complicated by the claim that he makes in this article that it's English as a language which has a, uh, has a privileged status. So um, I, I think that he takes it one step further, uh, we, uh, and in fact, clearly losing a part of his audience, a significant part of his audience, um, who, may have had, who may have in fact supported his, um, you know, his sort of the, the integrity of, of art and the integrity of the artist, but feeling deeply compromised by um, sort of the evaluative criteria that came in to produce this whole new uh, hierarchy. We've run out of time, unfortunately. My great thanks to you, Gary Viswanathan, uh, Patricia J. Williams, Manning Marable, and to all of you who've come here.